I'm going to let Yana actually introduce herself because she's, it's actually her turn. Is that all right? Sure. Okay, cool. <laughs> there you go. Do you need this thing here? Yeah. I do not need that chair. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm your substitute speaker for the session. There was another gentleman scheduled to do here. So uh, I apologize if you were looking for Dave Shu. Um, but I am with the University of California. I'm the Extension Forest Advisor for Humboldt and Del Norte counties. I've been there about 18 years. And I'm really interested in the resiliency of landscapes. I'm a forester. I'll, I'll throw that out as the frame of perspective that I think about these issues in, and the resiliency of the built environment, which I think has been well laid out in, in this morning and yesterday's presentations. What I'm going to do today is talk a little bit more about the mechanisms of loss and move from that coarse scale approach to the fine scale of the home. And I'll um, say that really when we talk about this, there's really no silver bullet. There is not one answer that's going to solve all of our challenges. It's going to be a collective set of actions and an integrated approach when you think about these issues. Okay. So I've got a little visual because I'm an extension agent. So how many of you like to build campfires, right? All of us in this room. This is a nice piece of Madrone firewood, it's a little bit on the small side. But if we were to start a fire, would we start with this material? No. Would we start with this nice redwood kindling here? Not quite, would we? We would actually be, if we didn't bring any newspaper, really thinking a lot more about the finer scale material. And here's some leaf material to, to kind of illustrate the point. So what today I'm going to do is help think about how we start a fire and how our home starts from the same kind of framework. Because it's all the little things that matter. And this is a wonderful challenge and opportunity as a little thing that matters. So today we're going to talk about both home design and retrofitting. And this is a topic that takes really a couple of hours to cover. There's a lot of fine points, but I'm going to hit the high points. And I know many of you will probably hmm, uh, will say, hey, you didn't cover all these issues. And you're right, I can't cover all of that in 20 minutes. But I'm going to leave you some references so that we can try and think about some of this. Um, let's see. So, the presentation is going to go from thinking about the mechanisms of how homes burn to thinking a little bit more about the, the position of the home and the landscaping and the vegetation that's adjacent to that. We'll get more into that in the next talk, though. Then we'll go into the vulnerabilities of the home design and then cover some of the resources. What gives me the ability to talk about this as a forester? I've had great colleagues to work with over the years, and one of them in particular is Dr. Steve Quarles. He's now emeritus with us, but he was our former wood durability expert, and we had at the Forest Products Lab uh, a small lab in the capacity to actually uh, test the mechanisms of, of um, ignition. And now he moved on to the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, and he has a laboratory the size of this this room here where he builds whole buildings and then exposes them to different wildfire exposures. So you'll see a number of photographs that will be from that simulated environment, but it's the only way to break down and understand what the actual process is of that loss. Um, this work is also informed by lots of uh, post evaluations, uh, as well as some folks that have done uh, work in looking at really those dispensable space inspections. So it's a collection of a, of a lot of people's work and uh, a lot of good ideas. So when we talk about what happened here in Sonoma County and, and in Mendocino and in Lake County, I think the real challenge to relate to this is that the homes were the most combustible part of the landscape. And using this image here, um, taken from within the tub's footprint, you can see that this home and garage had a tremendous amount of defensible space. Um, and I think that's the real challenge in trying to understand these issues is that it's um, Let's see if I can make this move, is that it's more than just defensible space. Let's see, how do I get? And within that framework, we've talked a lot about this just in casual references, but we have to think about those embers. And those embers can come in two forms. They can come in small bits of vegetation that catch on fire and then are wafted into the air column. We saw that video yesterday, a really good illustration of like a hailstorm of embers. And then it can move into construction related embers. So the embers that are wafted off the home once it's ignited. It's, so here's another illustration. Here's from Salt, South Lake Tahoe. And you know, there's a, a, you know, an abundant amount of green trees, but the home is being consumed. So embers really are responsible for the majority of building ignitions and loss. Again, you can see this in Fountain Grove. Um, 
This was taken at the end of October. I uh, had the opportunity, thanks to Carol Leone and others in this room, for a, a nice tour of, of the, the situation. And, and you can see that some of the vegetation caught on fire, but the majority of it did not. So let's talk a little bit about the basics of fire. For those of you who were here yesterday, we had uh, the fire triangles and here these sort of laid out. You know, fire is the product of fuel, oxygen, and heat. You know, you can't, um, you can't have a fire if you don't have air in there. And if you don't have enough heat, then it will not burn. Um, and together, when you think about fire behavior, so you know how that fire is going to um, move across the landscape, how intense it's going to be, again, that's a reflection of, again, fuel, weather, and topography. So can we change the weather? No, nope, can't change the weather. We can't change the topography, but we can change where we build our locations, build our buildings, build our homes. But we can change the fuel arrangement. So let's think a little bit more about what fuel is. I just gave the illustration of the madrone and the redwood and the leaf material, but fuel is anything that will burn. It can be the broom on your front porch, it can be your wood siding, it can be the roofing, it can be the fencing, it can be your lawn chair, it can be your lawn chair's cushion, it can be that pot of grass, it can be the newspaper pile that you've accumulated outside, it can be anything. And of course, it can be the trees and the vegetation and the landscape mulch. And so we have to think about the fuel that we've surrounded our homes by. And we've really come to a, a, a great understanding that many of our educational messages have been focused on this issue being externalized, this issue being externalized from the edge of the property coming in. Oh, if I can only build that defensible space from 50 feet or 100 feet working inward. And what the real lessons are is that we really need to operate from our front door outward. The, the skin of the building and everything that goes into that home envelope, really focusing in on those first five feet. And most of us in this room have probably seen Sunset Magazine over the years, and they've done a really good job giving us this sense of aesthetic uh, and other magazines too and other books about what our home should look like. And we tend to do this thing in the West Coast, which is anchor the home with vegetation. If you see a house that doesn't have landscaping that's gone in, it looks rather unusual. It's kind of floating. Well, we really need to shift and think about that aesthetic in a different way so that we can start to visualize a way that we don't have that combustible material right up against the house. It's not a huge shift, but it's giving it some space, giving that home some space to breathe, giving that home some space for protection. The next couple of talks, we'll talk more about those additional zones, but I just really wanna drill home the idea that we need to walk outside our front door and look at what's there. So within that non-combustible zone, that, what that does is it reduces the chance for flame contact and exposure. Um, you know, I am really missing a very critical slide here that jumped on me. This one here. Can I just click on that? And then maybe go down to the bottom left here to the slide viewer. No, no, no. No, I don't know. I need help. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was, I was struggling back there, but I really have to build a fun. Oh, there we go. So I'm sorry, I jumped around a little bit there, but let's talk a little bit about homes, how homes burn from wildfire first before I get deep into that, that uh, zero to five foot uh, perspective. So these are three types of exposures uh, illustrated, uh, two from within that, um, from in that laboratory uh, position. So these uh, up on the upper left is this concept of what embers look like and what ember wash can look like. And this is not, um, uh, you know, it's not over dramatized for this evaluation, but think about how much exposure both in wind and small material might come to your house. The flame front may never approach your house or may never approach the building. It may be more than a mile away, but your home could still be lost from that ember. I think the most common place that people think about uh, how, how a home or building may be lost is the actual fire flame, the fire front comes to you and you have, you have um, flame contact with a building. That's one of three different ways that a home may, may be consumed. The other way is with radiant heat. And radiant heat is just the, the building adjacent to your home is so hot 
that it actually causes combustion. And I think we've, if you ever had a wood stove and you may have known someone whose home burned because they stored some rags next to their wood stove or they put the newspaper a little too close to their wood stove and, and an ignition happens. It's the same concept. That radiant heat overwhelms the, the resistance of the building. So when you think about home loss, you have to both understand it from the types of exposures that it may experience. And it may experience all three. And so we have to design our homes to be able to be robust to all three types of exposures. Okay, sorry about that. So moving into that um, non-combustible zone, we're talking about reducing the capacity of, of uh, direct flame impact as well as ember exposure. So the real message is think about it on all sides of the house. Uh, I think a lot of folks like to have the front anchored by vegetation, as you can see in the, in the lower right. Uh, and then the back, it's okay. Well, we can have some uh, rock um, mulch and then we can have some lawn that comes up near to that. That's, that's perfect from a, from a um, defensible space perspective, but the front of the house in this picture illustrates some of the challenges. So defensible space has to be on all sides of the home, not just one or several. The other fixation that I hear a lot of people interested in is, well, what's the right plant to plant? There must be a list of fire safe plants out there. There are many lists out there, but keep in mind that any plant will burn under the right conditions. There is no perfect fire resistant plant. There's certainly ones that are, cause a lot of problems, but all plants will burn regardless how they're marketed. The most important piece is how they're maintained and where they're placed. So, is it properly irrigated? Is it properly pruned? And when you're talking about that zero to five foot zone or that five foot to 10 foot zone, really think about the open grown, uh, less structured, less resonant, uh, high moisture content plants. And you know, there are many good choices both in the native and drought tolerant uh, categories, but they both need to be maintained well. Uh, here's a picture from the Tubbs fire of cactus. Uh, it, it, it burned, it singed there. So just to illustrate that anything can burn under the right conditions. And I think, you know, we're focused on fire today and we're focused on trying to really build resilient communities. And there's a lot to this and there's a lot of trade-offs. I mean, we want our vegetation to not consume too much water. We want to reduce our water bills. We want to keep our streams flowing so that we have fish. We want to, you know, manage all of these issues and there's lots of trade-offs. So, you know, uh, a lot of our educational messaging has been around uh, mulching to make sure that you can preserve moisture. Uh, but the choice of mulching you use matters and the choice of location matters. So, um, you know, think about rock and hardscape. Um, think about lawns that are well maintained in that zero to five foot zone. And then, you know, be conscious about where you place that, that nice covering of, of wood-based uh, mulch because it will burn. There's a couple uh, illustrations on the bottom from the Tubbs fire just showing how, how fire was able to run up some of that, that mulching. So coming back to these ideas around the home itself and the home design, you know, I'm just hitting some of the high points. We talked a little bit about vegetation and placement. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the home design. You know, there are lots of choices. Um, there are folks that are going to be interested in marketing uh, very different products to you. But if you have one choice out there, the roof is the number one priority and making sure that you get that roof up to, up to standards. And the roof has a lot of vulnerabilities, um, both in what we uh, cover it in, how we finish it, uh, in how we vent. Um, and so you have to think about the, the whole home envelope. Um, and one of the ways I like to relate to it is from a rain jacket perspective. I live in a very rainy climate. Uh, I don't wear a plastic rain jacket. I don't wear a plastic rain jacket because while it does keep the rain off, it doesn't let the moisture out. It gets awfully clammy in there in those plastic rain jackets. And what we're asking our homes to do is be robust to rain, be robust to embers, but also to exhale. Just like we want to move that moisture within our rain jacket. So we've developed Gore-Tex, um, which works moderately well uh, for that task, but we're trying to design a home that both lets that moisture out as well as robust and protects the home from water and protects the home from other exposures, whether they be fire uh, or wind or you know, what they may be. So there's trade-offs and, and there's challenges into doing that. Fortunately, there's some new products that have been tested and are coming on the market that are, that are helping us out. But let's look at how we maintain that roof and how we design that system uh, to, to work together. So roofs, uh, while they, um, 
can be beautiful, they can also be difficult to install, and they also can have a number of weak points. I just want to illustrate a couple of these. Um, the nice terracotta tile roof there has uh, a need for bird stops uh, so that uh, material doesn't get up inside, whether that be a bird or whether that be an ember. So you may have this really nice robust exterior, but you've created a weakness if you haven't maintained the end of those um, tiles. Again, the, the picture on the left shows another gap and weakness there in that, um, I think it's a cement-based roof there. So, uh, you know, thinking about the assembly, thinking about the design, thinking about the installation, thinking about the maintenance through time is super important. Now we talked some about those leaf litter and how that leaf litter was what we want to start our campfire with. And leaf litter is super challenging because it accumulates in all these places that uh, it's often hard to remove. Uh, we heard earlier about gutters, um, that that was one of the, the primary items that uh, our firefighter on Monday talked about. And so you can see here that those gutters may accumulate leaf material, but so might the dormers. And the dormers may not be of the assembly ready materials. So if you have dormers out there, you have a weak point and there's some opportunity for some small choices to be able to make that wall assembly a bit more robust um, because it's likely that you will um, not be able to get every piece of leaf material off those roofs. So just some more illustrations of the gutter concept. Uh, this was, you can see, it's easy to get material in, in your gutter. Um, one of the, I think, interesting points was in some evaluations, you can see that a plastic gutter will melt and will fall away, uh, which could create exposure to the siding, whereas a metal gutter is gonna hang that, keep that material right there. And it, it's possible for the flames to get basically right underneath the roofing material. So if you don't have a metal drip edge, then you have another weak point in the way that roof is designed. Skylights, I think they're rather self-evident. Uh, we all want <laughs> a little more light, especially if you're under a redwood canopy, but uh, they don't have the same class A assembly rating that you do on your roof, and now you've created a bunch of vulnerabilities on the top of that roof and a real uh, need for maintenance. So vents, uh, I'm, I'm hitting some of the high points here. So we talked a bit about it from the need to exhale that material from, um, from the inside of the house. So you need both an inflow set of vents and you need an exflow set of vents to move that moisture through. Um, they are all weak points. They're all places where uh, embers can get in. And here's some just some visualization on the inside of, of a home uh, from that laboratory testing. You can see the embers coming on the inside of the building. In my case, I, of course, store my children's artwork in my attic. Uh, it's highly burnable. So think about what's in your attic and where those embers could land. And also think about what the venting material is made of. So well, the recommendations now are that we're moving from quarter inch to eighth inch or smaller. So you might want to look at how um, your venting system is set up and how it's, how it's designed. There can be relatively easy ways to make some changes. Uh, under California's Chapter 7A, which is the construction standards in the WUI zones, there are a number of approved and tested uh, venting systems. They have a, a variety of different designs, uh, from baffle systems, that's the one in the middle, to uh, two of them have an intumescent covering, one of my favorite new words. Um, and intumescent essentially means it, it reacts to the heat and it seals up and uh, that per it basically shuts them down. Uh, they will not perform again after that. You'll need to replace them if they've had fire exposure. Uh, but the one, you know, the, here's some foundation vents under picture A on the top left. It's about a $35, $40 vent. Uh, the gable and vents on the right are in the more like the 135, 150 range. So, uh, you know, there is some, uh, some money to put out there, but there are some changes coming. Ridge vents are great, they're important, uh, but they can also accumulate material and debris and can create an opportunity for fire to get inside your house. And so when it comes to, there's lots of different components of a house. Um, think about the walls and the, the vertical non-combustible zone. That's one of the big changes in that five foot mode. We're also talking about at least having a 12 inches to 18 inches of non-combustible material. Uh, you can see it makes more sense in the lower right picture as opposed to where you've got uh, a planter box right up against redwood siding. 
And then, of course, what do we store? Over time, uh, we don't tend to get rid of things. We tend to accumulate items. And so here's just some illustrations of how uh, we may be protecting our firewood from the rain period, but if we don't move it during the dry period, it becomes a place for ignition. Uh, here's the broom that's been left out on the front porch. It becomes also another place for ignition. Um, the little gaps make a big difference. We had embers in all of these fires blowing underneath uh, garage doors that didn't seal very well. Uh, so there's all the little things that matter. Um, and decks are definitely not a place to store materials, even though they seem so tempting. Fences, of course, are vulnerable. And the big change uh, that we're trying to illustrate here is that, you know, once the fence catches on fire, if it's anchored to the building, it will wick fire to the building. So, you know, the guidance is, can you install a metal gate uh, so that you can prevent spread uh, from that fence to the building, or can you uh, use a different material for that last transition to the house? And as we heard earlier, you know, a neighbor's house could be in that uh, defensible space zone and their survival may be more of a determinant of your own survival. So as communities, we need to work together to be able to uh, collectively think about these issues. Uh, Coffee Park really is uh, an illustration of, you know, high density. And once you had one home under, under ignition, uh, the radiant heat of one home easily overwhelmed the next building. The drip lines are about uh, the wall to wall are about 10 feet apart with the drip lines being about six feet apart. So there's just not enough space and separation once one home went for the others to be able to, um, to be able to withstand that kind of heat. So in conclusion, there's a whole lot to this. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to, you know, recommend that you think about what's on the outside of your home. Think about how your roof is designed. Think about how your roof is maintained. There's new opportunities to upgrade the venting system, which is, um, uh, you know, I think one your your most uh, your next priority and something that every one of us could do this year. Um, and then really think about that non-combustible zone that's adjacent to to the house. Uh, there are a lot of guidance out there. Um, I believe these talks will be made available, so I just embedded some links in here so folks can look at it both in uh, code and development and in Chapter 7a. But as I wrap up, I just really want to say it's about home design, it's about maintenance, it's about construction. All of that together is more important than any single product itself. Poor installation can cause uh, increases in vulnerability as well as um, you know, just lack of maintenance. So uh, we've got a webinar coming uh, with the California Fire Science Consortium on June 13th, and we'll have a bit more time to, to go through some of these materials. Um, and we have lots of publications available to, to assist folks through these, through these topics. So thank you very much. Do we have time for a couple of direct questions uh, for Yana? If someone would like, obviously we have discussion Time as well, and if you come up for questions, you just need to walk up to the microphone. Oh yeah. yeah. You're taking photos of it. Yeah, okay, how do I do that? Okay, cool. All right, go in the back. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'm one of those people who hates lawns. Okay. Um, and the fact that they use so much water. And but I do know from talking to one of my neighbors that it was his irrigated lawn that prevented the wildfire from getting to his house. Yeah. So I'm just wondering that, that those pictures you had of the, like the five foot non-combustible zone, does it have to be irrigated vegetation past that or like what? Because if, if we start saying everybody should have an irrigated lawn, we're going backwards. Absolutely. I just wanted to illustrate that non-combustible can look a lot of different ways. It can be rock mulch, it could be weed whipped, you know, area that has no vegetation really left on it. It could be uh, pavers, it could be cement, it could be, um, you know, some very, very low trailing plant uh, that could be grass. Um, it could be any number of, of different options, but just thinking about the flammability of that material. Okay, time for one more. Yeah. Um, you said that the, uh, you Ma'am, your microphone is not on. Yeah. 
Uh, you said metal drip edge. Mm -hmm. Is that something that harpoons the, the gap between the metal gutter and the underlayment of the roof? Yes. So I'm going to use my hands. So I'm going to plug this microphone in. So the metal drip edge, if you think about it, you've got your uh, plywood decking probably, and then you then attach a very small piece of flashing, which is essentially a piece of metal. It's like L bracket, shapes across. It's not very expensive. And then the um, gutter sits right underneath that whole piece, and then you put the assembly rated roofing on top of that. And so what that metal drip edge does is basically, if you've got a fire in the gutter itself, it's creating a, a barrier so that the flames don't wick underneath the roofing and get into the plywood or the oriented strand board or whatever you have as a part of your roof decking. And does that, can that be retrofit or does it have to be at construction? Uh, you could retrofit some of that. Um, yeah, we can talk some more about what kind of roofing you have and, and how, what that might look like offline if you'd like. In, um, for houses that are too close together, can you do fire resistant siding on that side and how close can you, you know, I, if houses were 30 feet apart, it wouldn't be a problem. But Right. Certainly, you can, we can talk about how that siding might look like and how to be more robust in terms of what kind of paneling you might want to do to reduce that exposure. And it could be your own garage, it could be your woodshed, it could be any number of things that are in your, you know, immediate curtilage zone that can create vulnerabilities. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much.